Hey, good morning. Merry Christmas to each and every one of you. I know it's a busy season, so thanks for sharing your time with us and with the Lord. The Lord loves you so much that He sent His Son to die for you and for me. Amen? And so we celebrate that this morning. God has a good word for us this morning. Before we get started, however, let me just drop off some stuff here first. Too much going on. I wanted to uh, bring up Chris Rhodes. I'm pleased to introduce Chris Rhodes to you. Um, Chris has joined our staff on a part-time basis as the Director of Worship and Creative Arts. So really excited about uh, Chris being here. This is his lovely wife, Bobby, and their five-month-old daughter, Kingsley. So I just want to introduce Chris to you, and please welcome him to our church family. Thank you, buddy. He is a gifted man. We've been so blessed over the years, so excited to have him on board. A couple other things before we get started. Um, if, if you're fairly new to, to this church and, and you're not sure if God's calling you here to you know, settle in here and possibly, uh, if you do settle, then to serve here in some capacity, um, starting in January, every month we're going to have something called Pizza with the Pastors. And it's just an opportunity to come and hang out, have some pizza, um, have some fun, and, and, and understand uh, who we are and what we're about and where we feel God's taken us and see if God would have you partner with us and, and join our church. So the first one is in January. It's January 14 at 1215 upstairs, and it just goes for about 30 minutes. And then every month after that, starting in February, we're going to do it on the final Sunday, the last Sunday of the month, starting in February. So every final Sunday of the month. So as you invite people or if you meet people that are newer, that's a great thing to point them to. Every month, the last Sunday of the month, starting in February, we'll do the first one January 14. So I just wanted to make mention of that to you. And then also, lastly, we have a Christmas Eve service tonight at 5. It's going to go for about 40, 45 minutes. And if you can join us, we'd love to have you tonight at 5 o'clock right here in, in the sanctuary. So um, thanks for letting me hit those things first. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. I'm going to do the best I can to stay out of God's way and just let His Word speak to us. God has so much to say in His Word. It's why we have it. And so God's Word is going to get the bulk of our attention this morning. And I'm going to just try to stay out of the way. Turn to Isaiah 9. We know these verses. Many of us know these verses out of Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 7. You ready? But there will be, and this is, this is about 700 B.C., about 700 years before Christ actually was born. And Isaiah's prophesying about this, this Messiah to come to save you and I from our sin. Verse 1 says, But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning, fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. And there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore, church, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Amen? God is so good and he did exactly that through Christ nearly 2,000 years ago. Oklahoma City made a startling and shocking uh, news on a Sunday morning. 
December 6, 1964. A 31-year-old mother gave birth to a child on, a, on the sidewalk at the corner of Sheridan and Broadway. A curious crowd watched without helping. The woman and her baby lay on the pavement for about 45 minutes in temperatures close to 30 degrees. A visitor from Tulsa summoned a taxi, and when the, when the cab arrived, however, the driver refused to take the mother to the hospital. Then the helpful stranger called the police to no avail. During the time the woman lay on the sidewalk, two patrol cars passed the scene, and neither one stopped. A former state representative happened to go by that way, and he stopped and called the fire department for an ambulance. He also sent a man across the street to a hotel to borrow a blanket, but the porter refused one to him. Meanwhile, the rescue squad arrived, and while waiting for the ambulance, Captain Bill Latham of the fire department and the former state representative, Bob Cunningham, decided to take the mother and her child to the hospital in their car. This unbelievable story heralded across America the next day on Monday, December 7, and doubtless around the world as well. And it's reminiscent of what happened in ancient Bethlehem <laughs> when another woman was heavy with child. Luke 2.7 says that she gave birth, Mary did, to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Perfect timing. I don't know if you did that on purpose, but that was, that was pretty good because I'm done with that story. God, you are so good, man. Your timing's perfect, Lord. I got another one coming up later, so cue it up. Oh, man, God is so good. Let's pray. Lord, it's good to laugh. It's good to reminisce and to recall your promises, Lord. We read in Isaiah 700 years, Lord, you made this promise of this King of Kings that would set us free from darkness and sin, and you did exactly that. And so it's for that reason that we gather here today to center our attention and our affection upon your son who came as a baby who, who grew up and who died for us as an expression of your love and your pursuit of us. And for that reason, we praise you and we say thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we all prayed and everybody said, amen. Let's, let's read the Christmas story, if you will. Turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 20 out of Luke chapter 2. You know, here's what's funny about cell phones. I, can, I promise you, every one of us in the past year, that's happened to us at least once, right? Like, bad timing, like, so, so sorry about my phone. I just love it. I love it. God is so good. All right, Luke 2. We're going to read 1 through 20. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. And this was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. And so Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. And he did this in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. And while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And so she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid, a laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. Wow, I wonder what that was like. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for who? For all the people. If you're breathing, this story is for you. If you're breathing, Christ is for you. I have no idea where I'm at. Verse 10, verse 11. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Chosen One. Verse 12, this will be a, a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in the manger. And then suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, 
glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go, right? I would say the same thing, like, let's go, man. Let's go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And so they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and, and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds, but Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them, just as had been told many people for hundreds of years prior. Our God is so good. Babies make a difference. Babies make a difference. A remarkably revealing article titled Babies Make a Difference appeared in the August 15, 1983 issue of Time magazine. And it was called, What Do Babies Know? Michael Lewis, a psychologist, presides over the data that was being gathered by the Institute for the Study of Child Development at Rutgers Medical School in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Among the startling facts are these. Babies are born legally blind. Although unable to see, a newborn nevertheless holds up a hand as if examining it within seven minutes after being born. Their ears function well. Within a few weeks, they recognize the sound of their mother's voice. (laughs) Incidentally, babies seem to prefer the tone of the female female voice over that of the male, which really works out well for most of us men. Right? When the baby starts going nuts, we can just say, hey, you know, scientific evidence says that I should not be holding this baby, and we're off the hook. I love it. (laughs) At 12 hours old, an infant which has never tasted a thing, not even his, his or her mother's milk, gurgles with satisfaction on receiving a drop of sugar water. At 23 days of age, the the baby can imitate adults. Beyond the risks and costs of rearing children today, Having a baby is an act of faith and hope, isn't it? It represents a belief in better things to come. And this is how this, this, is how this concludes. That's great. Now, this is just, this is the day of the Lord, man. <laughs> this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Gosh, man. It concludes this way, when a wrong needs writing, when a truth needs telling, when a song needs singing, when a soul needs saving, God sends a baby into the world to accomplish it. He accomplishes accomplishes His Word and His work through us and through His Son, Jesus Christ. Mm. So here's today's message, which you can see on the screen. Christmas, yep, it's all about the presents, isn't it? It's all about the presence. Christmas is all about the presence. It's about the presence of God. It's about the presence of God. We don't celebrate a day. We do, but we don't, right? We celebrate God's presence. It represents God's desire to be with His, with his creation, with us that were created in His image. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. God's Word is so good, church. We're going to read this, and I promise you, not too many verses in, you're going to say to yourself, why the heck are we reading this? I promise you I'll explain. We're going to read all of chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, very first book of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And of course there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, day one, or one day. Then God said, let there be an uh, an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And so God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse. 
And it was so, and God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, day two. Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them, and it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning. Day three. Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, which is the sun, and the lesser light to govern the night, which is the moon. And he made the stars also. And God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, day four. And then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. And God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. There was evening, there was morning, day five. And then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And on that same day, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you, and to every beast on the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, day six. Okay? So now we get, we get into chapter 2, and he, in, in uh, the writer, Moses, uh, recaps. So check this out. We're going to read the first seven verses of chapter 2. Before we do that, I, I actually want to point out something to you. Go back into the early verses of Genesis 1. In verse 3, God said, let there be. Verse 3, let there be, and there was. Verse 6, he says, let there be. And there was. Verse 9, he says, let the waters below. And there was. In verse 14, he says, let there be. And it was. Verse 20, he says, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures. And that's exactly what happened. In verse 24, he says, let the earth bring bring, bring forth living creatures. And that's what happened. In verse 26, he says, let us make man in our own image. He just says, let, 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 let. And that's exactly what happens. But check this out. In verse 1 of chapter 2, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts. By the seventh day, God completed his work which which he had done. And so he rested on the seventh day from all his work which, which he had done. And then God blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. And this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day of the Lord when he made heaven and earth. And so now, now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth and no plant of the field had yet sprouted for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. In verse 7, 
Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. And every other thing that he created, he just said, let it be, or let it be created. And it was. But when it came to us, when it came to man, when it came to woman, he breathed into us. And from the very beginning, it's God's way of saying, we are, my presence needs to be a part of your presence. Your presence needs to be a part of my presence. We belong together. And so here he creates everything. He could have just let us be. But imagine he forms us and he breathes into us life, showing from the very beginning of creation account that we are in the presence of the Almighty God, that God's presence is with us and is meant to be with us forever. And that's really the story of all of Scripture, is God's presence always being present. I just think it's amazingly powerful. And so here are the takeaways for our time this morning. The presence of God (laughs) is always present. The presence of God is always present. God has a presence. I have a presence. But if I go hide somewhere, I have a presence, but I'm not present with you if I'm I'm not around. Right? So it's not just that God has a presence, but the presence of God is present. And there are often times that we wonder, God, where are you? And God wants us to know, I'm present. I have been the minute I breathe into you. I breathe life into your nostrils. I am present with you. And that's really the whole gospel story is God's presence is present. Amen? But here's what's also cool. He's not just present, just kind of like hanging out. He pursues us. God pursues us. He's pursuing some of you right now. He's pursued some of us in the past. He'll pursue us in the future. God pursues us. He leaned over and breathed into us. His presence is meant to be with us at all times. And so he will pursue us. I have two grown children. I love my kids. No matter what happens, I will always pursue my children because I love them, because I help bring life to them. And so I will pursue them always. God is always going to pursue you. You cannot hide from God. He will pursue you at all times. Aren't we thankful for that? Yes. But what's also cool is when he, when he grips you and when you surrender to him, he purifies you. He sets you free from your sin. He sets you free from bondage. He sets you free from all the things that hold us back. And the freedom that he wants to give us is found in Christ. And so we're purified. He makes us righteous like that the minute we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. We are purified from our sins. We have fellowship with the Almighty God who breathed into us way back in Genesis 1 and 2. It's just such a good word for us. So we don't just celebrate a day. We celebrate the presence of a God that's present, that's pursuing, and that purifies us at all times. And so I just pray that as you go through 2018, that you always, always, always claim the presence of God in your life. Even when you feel alone, even when you feel like he's absent, he's not. He breathes into us. He's present all the time. And he's pursuing you, and he wants to purify you. Amen? So our first takeaway, the presence of God is present. I'm going to put on the screen Exodus 29. Exodus 29, 44 through 46. Perfect. The Lord says, I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate Aaron and his sons to minister as priests to me. I will dwell. I will dwell. God. God will dwell among the sons of Israel, the people that follow him, and will be their God. Then they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them up out of the land of Egypt, out of bondage, out of sin, out of slavery to sin. They shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them, because I am the Lord their God. Our God, we don't gather in his name, we gather in his midst right? We gather in his midst. The Lord is here. The presence of God is present. Our faithful Lord, listen, he doesn't just deliver us from our sin. If that's all he did, that's a good deal, 
right? Jesus, thank you for, for delivering me from my sin. But he doesn't just deliver us. He dwells with us as well. There's a difference there, right? Jesus doesn't just show up to some place where you've got to pay your debt of sin and say, hey, I got it. My name's Jesus, by the way. Nice to meet you, Dave. Right? And pay that debt and split. He doesn't just deliver us from our sin. He says, man, I'm going to pay that debt and we're going to hang out, man. Well, for how long, Jesus? For forever, man. We're going to hang out for forever. We're bros now. We're, right? Whatever. It's kind of cool. He doesn't just deliver us. He dwells with us. Did you know that? Here's some terms that you may know, you may not know. Deism. Deism is the belief that God has indeed created the universe but remains apart from it. And sometimes we feel that way. And he permits his creation to administer itself through natural laws. Deism thus rejects the supernatural aspects of religion such as the Bible and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and it stresses the importance of ethical conduct. conduct whoever gets to determine that, right? Theism. There's all sorts of evidence for theism. Theism is the belief in the existence of God, especially belief in one God as creator of the universe, intervening in it and sustaining a personal relation to his creatures as displayed by this baby named Jesus, as displayed on the cross, as displayed by the Holy Spirit that lives within each and every follower of the Almighty. Since God is spirit and is invisible, the means he uses to reveal his presence will always be inadequate to fully reveal who he is. In this sense, the God of the Bible is a hidden God, but a hidden God who still overwhelmingly makes himself known. He appears in nature. Romans 1 tells us, look at this, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. How? For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that we or they are without excuse. God is present. God is present. He also appears in human form. We don't have time to get into that, but as in, as in Genesis 18, where the Lord appears to Abraham to tell him that a year from now, Sarah, his aged wife who was barren, would be having a child exactly one year later she did. She had a baby boy named Isaac. Also in Genesis 32, where we see Jacob, Isaac's son, wrestling with God until daybreak. And just like we read in Luke chapter 2, where we see a baby boy, Jesus, born in the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. God's presence is always present. And so God, who cannot be seen, he chose, he chose means to, or ways, means to reveal himself, which harmonize both his transcendence, his holiness, his otherness, and his imminence, his closeness. So he chooses ways to display both his greatness and his closeness to us by sending us a child, by sending his Holy Spirit to us. Even Jesus, like his Father, keeps a strong presence with us. Look at Matthew 28, 18 through 20. The last things that Jesus uh, is recorded speaking in Matthew chapter 28. And Jesus came and he spoke to them. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that I commanded you. And then he says, I am with you when? Always. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The Christmas story isn't just about our salvation. It's about the presence of God. It's about the presence of God that started all the way back in Genesis, where God breathed into us, and he's still breathing. He's still in fellowship with us. He's pursuing us. He's purifying us. And, of course, we see the same ministry within the Holy Spirit. Look what John says. Jesus says in the, in the book of John 14, 16 and 17. He says, I will ask the Father, Jesus says, and he will, he will give you another helper. Don't grieve that I'm leaving, Jesus is saying, that he may be with you forever. 
That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. God is always present. God is always present. Our second takeaway is that the presence of God is pursuing. Honestly, be honest. Have you ever felt God pursuing you? Raise your hand. Have you just had a sense that God has at some point in your life pursued you? Yes. It's just what he does. It's what he does. Sometimes that's uncomfortable, isn't it? But he loves us so much and he pursues us nonetheless. Go back to Genesis chapter 3. Go back to Genesis. We're going to look at chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Genesis 3, 1 through 9. Now there's the serpent, right? We know about the serpent in Genesis. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And so the serpent says to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Oh, that serpent, he's starting to lie. And the woman said to the serpent, serpent from, the tr- from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God had said you shall not eat from it. Or touch it, or you will die. And the serpent says to the woman, you surely will not die. Don't think that the serpent doesn't talk to us like that today. He didn't just stop, right? He's still lying to us today, church, which is why we need to be immersed in truth so we can recognize the lies of the evil one. The serpent says, you surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, that surely sounds like a good thing. Why wouldn't I want that? When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and she ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And so the man and his wife, they hid themselves because they had sinned from the presence, right? And this is what sin does, right? It causes us to run from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. In verse 9, the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Where are you? And so the pursuit starts. We sin and we run from the presence of God. We fall short. We fail in something and we run from the very presence of God. And I want you to know that's okay. Because God's going to come after you and He's going to say, where are you? Where are you? The presence of God is not only present, but He pursues us. And there's nowhere you can hide where God can't find you and pursue you because he loves you, right? Because he loves you. And so he pursued back in Genesis chapter 3, and then we get to the New Testament, and he pursues even still. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world. That means he loved you. Plug your name in there. For God so loved me that he gave his only begotten son. He gave, he sent him on a commission that, whatever, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world would be saved through him. And so God pursues us through Christ. He wants to, us to know that his presence is still real as it was in Genesis 1 and 2, as it is today. God pursues because he loves us. And so we see his pursuing by sending his son to us. John 16, verses 7 and 8, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. So we see, we see God pursuing us in Genesis, we see Jesus pursuing us in the early part of John, and now we see the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away, for if I don't, the helper will not come to you. Because the Helper is pursuing us. But if I go, I will send Him to you. And He, when He comes, He will pursue the world to convict the world concerning sin and righteousness. So it's God pursuing us through His Holy Spirit, convicting us of sin, wanting us to to desire righteousness instead of sin. And so He pursues us in the garden. He pursues us through Christ. And He pursues us through the Holy Spirit because God wants us to be in His presence. 
Mm. Our third takeaway is that the presence of God is purifying. The presence of God is purifying. Turn to Psalm 51, the psalm that was written by David. Psalm 51. The presence of our God purifies us. Listen, <laughs> there's nothing we've done or could do that God can't purify us from through the blood of Christ. Nothing. I'm so horrible. I've done horrible things. Yes, that's why Christ died for you. There's nothing from the least type of sin to the worst type of sin that the blood of Christ can't purify us from. It's the perfect atonement, the perfect sacrifice, the perfect substitute for all of our sin is this perfect person, Jesus Christ. Psalm 51. We're just going to read the first 11 verses. David cries out to God. See, he understood this. He says, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. David had sinned horribly by sleeping with another man's wife and then killing her husband. And he turns to the Lord. That's a horrible thing what King David did. But he knows where to go. He knows who can purify him. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. There's nothing I can do about it, God, on my own. Against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and you're blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. I was born into sin, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Purify me, he says, with hyssop, and I will be clean, because that's what you do, Lord. If you purify me, Lord, I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Oh God, create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. The presence of God purifies this church. When we falter, when we sin, and when we come up short, Run to God. He's pursuing you. Run to Him and ask for Him to purify you, to set you free, to deliver you from whatever that is that you're wrestling with. Titus 2 says something very similar. Titus 2, 11 through 14. He writes this. He says, For the grace of God has appeared. <laughs> for the grace of God has appeared. That's what Christmas is. Bringing salvation to everybody. Instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every, right? Every lawless deed. And to do what? And to purify for himself a people for his own possession so that we can be zealous for the works of God. Mm. The presence of God is purifying. Let me close with this story, and then I'm going to close with a verse right after that. In 1981, Harry Reasoner, do you remember that name, Harry Reasoner? He was a newscaster and journalist. He said this about Christ, about the baby Jesus. He says, everybody has seen babies, and most people like them. If God wanted to be loved as well as feared, he moved correctly here. Right? If God wanted to be loved as well as feared, he moved correctly by sending Jesus as a baby. If he wanted to know his people as well as to rule them, he moved correctly here. For a baby growing up learns all about people. 
If God wanted to be intimately a part of man, he moved correctly here for the experience of birth and familyhood is our most intimate and precious experience. And so it comes beyond logic, he says. It is what Bishop Carl Morgan Block used to call a kind of divine insanity. It is the story of Christ. It is either all falsehood falsehood, or it is the truest thing in the world. It either rises above the, the, the tawdriness of what we make out Christmas to be, or it's just part of the Christmas story and completely irrelevant. The way the world views Christmas. God's presence is present. God's presence pursues us because He loves us. And God's presence purifies us. Amen? Let me put this verse on the screen, and I'm going to ask the worship team to come up while I'm reading this verse. Ephesians, Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 6. Thank you, guys. And we just went through this a few months ago when we were in the book of Ephesians. Paul writes that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And we used to formally walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air and of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, like everybody else, even as the rest. But God, but God, but God. Jesus is a but God story. We were in trouble, but God sent Christ. But God, being rich in His mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together, how? With Christ. Not by Christ, with Christ. We were alive together with Him, being present with Him and Him present with us. And He raised us up, how? With Him. Not just by Him, but with Him. And He seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Christmas isn't just about Jesus being born to deliver us from our sins. It's further evidence of God dwelling amongst those that he loves and adores. And so he pursues us and he purifies us. I'm going to pray. And I don't know where you guys are at with the Lord, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to just really reflect on today's message and ask the Lord to come into your life because he's pursuing you potentially. Not potentially, he is pursuing you. You might potentially be the one he's pursuing in this room, right? So I want to give everybody here an opportunity to really give God your life. He's pursuing you. He's present. He wants to purify you from your sin. So I'm going to pray and just pray with me. And then when I'm done, the worship team is going to lead us in a few songs to close up our time together. Almighty God, we're humbled. We see your desire to be with us from the very beginning of Scripture to the very end of Scripture, Lord. You're you desire to be present with us, and you are present with us. And so you pursue us because you want to purify us. If you have not allowed the Lord to purify you from your sin, to set you free because of what Christ has done, I want to give you that opportunity right now. We're just going to pause for a second, and I want you to take the time to just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for pursuing me. I commit my life to you. Purify me from my sin. Thank you for your presence. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that we may walk together every day from this day forward. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen.